Hi, I'm Kendall, and I'm going to be leading the Q&A. Um, I've been keeping bees in the Bay Area for about 10 years, and I keep in the ballpark of 30 hives, and I keep them in a variety of places, including my backyard, other people's backyards, um, the roof of the Redwood City Library. I keep bees over at Filoli. Um, so it's definitely expanded from, I started with one little hive in my backyard and had no idea what I was doing and joined the guild and learned a lot of information. So I think you guys are absolutely in the right spot. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. And if it's a little slow, I can go off some of the questions that have been pre-submitted to me. No question is off limits. Um, so keep it about bees, I guess, but <laughs> so I can answer your bee questions. We've got Gretchen raising a hand. Gretchen, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, I was just wondering, I think for my husband and myself, both of us are, we are brand new to this. We've just been reading and learning and educate, trying to educate ourselves as much as possible. But in doing all of that, we've both become a little concerned um, about the mites and about how likely are we to lose our colonies in the first year um, and just are there any like Bay Area statistics that maybe could hopefully ease our minds a little bit? So I would say I think the the guild has tried to do statistics in the past on losses um, and I I don't know that we've done one in recent years but I mean the national average is that 40 percent of all bee colonies are lost every year. So that means if you've got two beehives that you are still very likely to lose one um, because mites, they are a big deal. And honestly, we don't, as beekeepers, we don't have this under control yet. Um, so I think there is a, a video that we sent out about the Varroa mite, um, but just a, a quick little uh, summary is that the Varroa mite is a pest that bites the bees and transmits disease. If you're a beekeeper, you're also a mite keeper. There are mites in there. Um, so just even if you don't start out with mites, uh, the density of beehives in the Bay Area, they're going to be transmitted. So they are pretty uh, present in every hive. So what I recommend for first year beekeepers and honestly all beekeepers um, is just keeping an eye on it. So the, the sugar roll is a great way to monitor for mites. And so that's where you have a little peanut butter jar with a screen lid. You take the um, powdered sugar, put it in, you take a half cup of bees and put it in there, swirl them around and shake out the mites. So the mites lose their grip on the bees and you can count your infestation level. And from there, you can really kind of decide what to do. So there are treatments that you can put in most of the available treatments right now are either um, caging the queen in some way, so stopping her from laying eggs, so removing that place for mites to breed, because the mites breed inside the cocoon of the baby bee. So if you're removing cocoons, you're removing a place for them to breed, and then uh, bringing the mite population down. So in spring, a lot of experienced beekeepers are dividing their hives, splitting their hives, creating a period where there's no queen while they're raising a new queen. And this actually is some natural mite control. Other options are you can get some organic treatments. They are insecticides, basically. They're killing little pests. So you have to be careful with how you apply it. But if you apply it according to the directions, that is um, a great way to keep mites under control. And then there are more caustic things that you can use, but there are currently things under development because we have learned a lot about the mite in the last several years. So I would say it's it's really hit or miss. Like I this year I had a really good year and a lot of my hives made it. Like I'd say my success rate right now is about 75%. That being said, three years ago, I lost every colony but one. So I lost like 90% of my bees a few years ago. And that was de like that was devastating to me as an experienced beekeeper. I was like, what have I done? Um, so it is certainly different. Like when you get a cat, you don't get this disclaimer of like, oh, there's a 50% chance that this cat is gonna <laughs> not make it its first year. Like that's a pretty terrifying thing with your pets, but 
Um, unfortunately, it is a very real thing out there. And the best thing you can do is monitor for mites and just be aware of your infestation levels so that you have some ability to do something about it. The other thing I recommend is having two hives because then you're playing the odds. So if you have one hive that doesn't make it, hopefully you've got that second hive makes it. Um, so two hives is a great way to play those odds. So I hope that answered your question well. It looks like we've got some more and, questions being answered in the chat. Kendall, can yes? I uh, chime in here? So as a, a first year beekeeper three years ago, um, I understand the fear is I thought it was all easy peasy that they just survive and my hive collapsed and uh, I wrote the guild and they all said, yeah, that's, that's gonna happen. So you have a great support network through the guild um, Gretchen, uh, you don't have to worry about that. But the other thing is, is that even if your hive collapses and you lose the bees, you are absolutely set up for a great start on the next year. Um, all your equipment is still good. You have drawn comb, you have a lot of frames, you got all the equipment, you're ready to go. And the guild um, has like a, a very specific low price for package bees. And you could just start with the bees again in April and you're off and running. Uh, so it's emotionally painful to lose a hive, but it's also not the end of the world. And you learn more and more as time goes on. And that's, uh, you increase your odds to success. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for chiming in, Guy. Mookie, it looks like you've got a question if you want to unmute yourself. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, we're trying to figure out the best location to put the hive. And um, there are a few times, a uh, handful of times in the year where it gets pretty windy where we are. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much that is an issue, except for, of course, it toppling over. But mm -hmm. aside from that, is it is it an issue? I'd say um, the wind is probably the biggest issue for the bees flying. Um, so if it gets too windy, they kind of, um, they might stay in because usually wind I, I find is accompanied with cold. And so the bees are usually indoors a little bit more. So if it is possible to have a wind break, either like a, a bush or a little small fence near the hive, um, that, that could help them out a little bit. But that being said, they might not fly as much on a, a windy day. I'd say the only location that I really keep bees that's excessively windy would be the rooftop of the Redwood City Library. But they even they have kind of a, a wind break right around the hives. Um, so unless you're getting like a real gale force wind regularly, that, that would be the hive toppling um, sort of thing. But in terms of sighting your hive, I haven't had as big of a problem with wind. Does anyone else, any of our other beekeepers have any issues with wind or any tips on wind? Um, this is Elodie. I'm in San Mateo and I think San Mateo, near the bay. And I think it's fairly well known. There are a lot of um, people who do wind kite surfing and stuff out here. So um, I have raised beds um, that provide a little bit of a windbreak. I don't have them right in front of the hive, but maybe six feet back from the hive. And that's that seems to help. Okay. Great. Yeah, so having a little windbreak sounds like the um the tip of the day for that i think right. other and also in full sun kindle because you were you were mentioning that sometimes it's associated with cold mm -hmm. uh, so i would say not so much in, in san mateo but i do have them in full sun i think with, for various reasons but one of those is because it's warmer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there and there are a lot of um, considerations for if uh you're citing your beehive i think if you're reading a beekeeping book it's like you want to have morning sun, afternoon shade. I'd say for a, a suburban beekeeper, I, I think I kind of retool my recommendation list. So my, my first recommendation is uh, avoiding people who do not want to be in contact with your bees. So it's like if you, the only place to put your bees is in your front yard pointing and it the entryway to your house. My, me, not so great. Like we get a lot of Amazon packages these days. So your Amazon packages might start disappearing if you've got a beehive pointed right at your walkway. Um, so minimizing interaction with people who do not want to come into contact with bees is the best thing. I actually do that by pointing my bees straight at a fence. So they're in the backyard and I've got about a foot from the entrance to um, the fence and the bees come up and they kind of have to go backwards over the top of the hive. So, because my yard is very small. And so that gets the bees up high and I can use the rest of my yard. I can garden in my yard without being covered in bees. Whereas if I pointed them straight into my yard, 
bees everywhere. <laughs> so that that's my top thing. And then the nice to haves after that are like, um, and usually wind breaks can really help uh, uh, with the flight path of your bees as well. So if you've got bees in an area you don't want them in, having a little wind break, either of a bush or a fence, uh, raised garden beds, very helpful to keep the bees in their space and humans in their space. Um, but I keep most of my hives also in full sun. Uh, so they don't get the, the morning sun and afternoon shade. It just means I'm hot when I keep my bees is because it's I'm in my bee suit uh, dripping sweat. So <laughs> the first question that I've got here is we're getting our first bees in a few weeks. And I know your video, you said you don't supply extra food for your new bees, but as a beginner, would you recommend it just to be safe? Um, and what are your thoughts on marking queens, especially for a new uh, beekeeper? So it's time, two questions bundled into one and I'll try to answer that. So in getting your new bees, feeding them kind of depends on how you have purchased your bees. Um, if you have purchased a nuke, so a nucleus colony, that is usually five frames that have a queen bee, it has worker bees, it's got baby bees already in there. So it has eggs, larvae, pupae, it has food usually in there. So it's got bee bread, which is a mixture of pollen and nectar. Um, and then it usually has some honey or nectar available for them as well. So with a nuke, you likely don't have to feed your bees because they've come with food. They've come with young bees, worker bees, forager bees. So they can go out and forage and bring in enough food. If you've got package bees, so a package of bees is a queen bee um, and then a whole mess of worker bees who've probably never met that queen prior to her being put in the box. So um, they're kind of all jumbled together in there. And they are also um, packaged with a can of sugar syrup. So that is their food for the road because they've got nothing in that box. And for your package, you'll dump it into your beehive. Again, they've got nothing. They've got to build out wax. So um, I usually, I've found that just having them finish off the can of syrup in my area works out just fine. So I do feed them the rest of that can of syrup. And then by the time it's gone, they, they're foraging and bringing in their own food. Um, but you could continue to feed them because as a new beekeeper, you don't, you probably don't have drawn comb. You've got foundation. So you just have sheets of nothing. And the bees have to consume a lot of nectar in order to excrete beeswax. Um, so that, that nectar flow that's happening right now, so all these flowers blooming, is causing them to ooze out wax and that's how they're building their home. So you could feed them to kind of boost that. Um, but I do find usually when we get rain in the Bay Area, we get a lot more flowers. There's still a lot blooming. People still irrigate their gardens. So if you are in um, a suburban area, you're probably getting a lot of food for those bees. If you are kind of on the outskirts of the Bay Area, like so if you border 280, the 280 corridor, that's where I find it does get to be a little tougher and you're more likely to have to feed your bees a little bit more depending on what's available. So in the spring, there might be a lot, but in the fall, it might just be like those hillsides are extra crispy and there's nothing. Um, so you might have to end up feeding, but if you are in the dense suburbs, odds are your neighbors are irrigating and having all these blooming plants for them to eat. So that's why I don't feed my bees, but you can always feed your bees and on a first inspection, look through those frames, see if you see food being stored. If you see shiny nectar in those holes, if you see the brightly colored pollen, then your bees are doing pretty well. So if you see that, especially in the corner of all your frames of babies, then I would say you don't have to feed them anymore. Um, so that's really the, the measure that I use is if they've got stored food in their comb, then you're good. So that answered half of it. Um, for the marked queen part, let's see, is Conrad still with us right now? Here we go. I'm actually right here with my, with my bees. I'm, I literally work bees right now. I'm, um, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm, I literally, I'm just, uh, I'm just opening it up. So here they are, all the bees. <laughs> uh, my queens are all marked and uh, there's five years of colors. This year is white. Last year is blue. So if you see a blue queen, you know that she was made, uh, created or made or uh, 
whatever in uh, in 2020 and this year 2021 is white mm. um so conrad provides so yeah. nukes and he just said his his bees are, his queens are marked um we have the same supplier that we did from 2019 when i got the nukes from the guild supplier um those were not marked mm -hmm. um and i i don't know whether or not the queens from the packages are marked if anybody's on who knows please feel free to pipe in sure and i'll I'll just answer a general marking question of, no, you don't have to have a marked queen. Um, but here are the reasons why I like to have a marked queen is because just like Conrad said, is like, there's different colors. There's five different colors because queen bees can live for about up to five years. So if you Google queen bee color this year, you'll come up with the color. This year is white. So you'll find a little white dot on the back of your queen's thorax, so the middle part of her body. And uh, for me, this actually tells me a lot of information when I do see my queen. So if I open my hive and I see a queen with a white mark, I know, hey, that's the queen I started with, super. Um, and then at the end of this year, if I've got a great queen, I breed my queens. So next year, when I see my queen with a white dot on it, I'm like, great, that's the same queen that was amazing last year. And so I can breed her. Even without breeding though, it does tell you some information about your hives. So if you've heard of swarming, so that's when the bees maybe get a little crowded or they have an urge to procreate. That means the queen bee leaves with half the bees in the hive, creates a new hive, and then the existing hive stays behind. So if I come into my hive and I see an unmarked queen, so a queen with no dot on her, I know, hmm, either my queen died or my bees swarmed. So it actually tells me some extra information about my hives. So I do like to keep marked queens. If you would like to try marking queens, don't be, don't be too intimidated. Um, there's actually the one-handed queen catcher is um, a nifty little thing sold by Man Lake that is really, I'd say that's beginner level queen marking. Um, it's kind of like catching a spider in a cup with a piece of paper, but for queen bees. So you can kind of place it gently over your queen bee on the frame. It scoops her up and then it's got like a little push pop in it and you can bring her up to the top and mark her right on the back. Um, so I would definitely, you can, there's some things you can do wrong and your queen bee is a very important bee, but if you're interested in doing that, um, there's a lot of information out there and I think maybe I'll, I'll put together a video hopefully a little later in the year and how to mark but hopefully we'll also have a bee buddy program so Alex is helping put that together so I will send that out after this meeting is there's a little form to just say your name where you are um, and your experience so which right now is um, you're new so you're looking for someone to help you out so we're hoping to get some people kind of paired up together so that you can have some mentors or at the very least if you're both new just have someone to bounce some ideas off of because even two new beekeepers together you can do a lot with each other and it's super helpful so don't feel that you have to mark your queens but if you do want to there might be someone in the guild to help you out walk you through it and there's a lot of tools to help you out as well so i hope that answered the question and i think um andrew has been super patient with his hand raised this whole time. So Andrew, what can I do for you? Yeah, I've got a couple questions being suburban in Redwood City. One was if I want to create a water source that like I hope they'll use versus neighbors pools or things like that. Um, how close to the hives should I have that water? Should it be you know in sun, not in sun? And I know I've heard that they like brackish water more than filtered clean water. So I was gonna do like a little pond for them. Mm -hmm. um, that's the first question. And then the second one is about uh, vermin, both domesticated dogs and the wood rats and stuff that we have in the suburban areas. Sure, absolutely. So I'd say for water, it sounds like you're off to the right start is I like, I do like to put mine in sun um, because they kind of do end up there um, it, that's not a requirement. Actually, my current waterer for my backyard bees is in shade and they do find it when it's hot and they need it. So my, my backyard is in Alameda, which is, we get dew almost year round. So when they did need it was when it got hot. And this is going to inadvertently answer another question that I got 
which is what do I do with my bees when it's hot? So bees like to be about our body temperature. If you are hot and sweating, then the bees are probably hot as well. They ventilate their hive by fanning their wings. But if it's the air temperature is up in the hundreds, like a very big heat wave, they need additional water. And they actually use it for evaporative cooling. So they're collecting water, placing it throughout the hive, and fanning their wings, and they're cooling down just like how we cool down by sweating. Um, so especially on hot days, it's important to have a water source. And I like to have it established all year round so they know where it is and they don't end up in my neighbor's pool. So in terms of distance, I try to keep it within like 10 to 15 feet of the hive, but not directly in front of the hive where the bees are taking off. Because when the bees take off from the hive, they cleanse themselves, so they pee. So right when they come out of the hive, that's when they go to the bathroom. And so you don't want them peeing or pooping in your water source, because if the bees are unhealthy, it can actually help transmit disease because they're then defecating in their water source. So you wanna make sure it's outside of their flight path, but near enough. Um, and all that being said, I have had problems with, bees love water running over rocks. That is what I found to be their absolute favorite, but you could put out a dish with rocks, a dish with corks in it, a little pond with duckweed in it. There's a lot of options. Um, but I had like a neighbor on the other side of the fence that had this wet rock running waterfall. And I actually did end up providing water straight into my beehive using a feeder. Um, so I used an entrance feeder. So one of those little jars and I stuck it in there because I could not keep those bees off of that fountain. Um, it was just so appealing for them. Um, so that is not ideal. You don't want to provide water straight into the hive usually because they kind of, it can mess with their moisture. But if they are in your neighbor's pool all the time and your neighbor is like, hey, you got to do something, I'd say that is the like, I am providing water straight into my bees and that is as close as I can get it to them, um, I think is what you can do. Um, and then in terms of other critters, um, typically, what I found with dogs is dogs typically learn pretty fast, like they'll stick their nose in the no entrance of the beehive once. And then <laughs> that's kind of it because they'll get a sting on the nose. Monitor your pets when you put your beehive there. If you want to be extra cautious, you can put up a fence, um, like a baby gate around your hives, and that is going to be really helpful. But typically, um, the, the pointy end of the bee typically discourages animals from going around them. With rats, as long as you've got um, like a strong colony, typically it's not a problem. If you're having persistent problems with rats, like chewing into the entrance of your hive and sneaking in there, they actually sell something called a mouse guard, um, which is like a little metal strip that you can put on. I have not had to do this in honestly any of my hive locations. I think the bees, the way Langstroths are developed, it, it seems to be going pretty well unless the rat is just determined to get in there. Um, so I have heard of a few hives in the Bay Areas and putting a mouse guard on helps a ton. And you can buy those for cheap um, directly from Man Lake. And I think they might even carry them at Peninsula Feed Store. And if they don't, they'll special order them for you. Um, so you don't have to do a whole Man Lake order for a $2 piece of equipment. So I'm gonna answer some more that were asked in advance. And one of them is, so we're starting with an eight frame length straw hive kit and it only came with one deep box. Do you recommend getting a second deep for the first season as well as a super or should we not expect honey our first season? Um, I'd say in, in terms of setting your expectations, I would not expect honey, but I would prepare for honey. Um, so I would always want to be prepared for the scenario where like, oh, my hives are great and bringing in all this honey. So I'd say if you've got a deep box, you want two deep boxes for your brood chamber. So where the babies are being raised. Um, and then you would want two medium boxes for your honey supers. And I would say start the season with that, with all of that equipment. So not immediately on your beehive. Your beehive is gonna start at one deep. And as it starts occupying that whole deep, so when they're about 80% full, then you're gonna add the second deep. And then when that second deep is 80% full as well, so they're taking up about 80% of their space, 
then you put on a honey super. And so that's how I add, um, is only as the bees need it. Um, so you don't start with the whole hive big, um, but that way you have it. Because usually I find that when I open my hive, I'm like, oh, my bees need this right now. And that's not the time to be going online and placing your order. Um, because then it's gonna be a few weeks down the road, maybe by the time you get that onto your hive and your bees are gonna be overflowing and potentially swarming because they don't have enough space. So get all your equipment to begin with. Um, and with the two deeps, two mediums, I actually run five mediums. So I have no deeps in my entire setup. My brood chamber is three mediums um, and then two mediums as my honey supers. So, um, and I have five boxes prepared for all of my hives sitting usually in my garage or in storage just for when I need it. There was another nuke question. All right, I bought a nuke. What am I, how do I get this into the hive? And it's super easy. That's the best part about nukes is the nuke is using frames. So that's your boxes are filled with frames already. So if you got a kit, you've got an eight frame box or a 10 frame box. So it'll have uh, 10 of those frames in it. In preparation for your nuke, take out the middle five of whatever size eight or 10 frame box you got. So you'll take out five of those frames and just set them aside, put them in your garage for storage. And then when you get your nuke, you'll open the nuke and it's basically just a tiny little beehive. You'll take out each frame one by one and place it inside of your hive. And that's it. So it's basically a hive inspection where you're taking something out, looking at it. And then when you're putting it back, rather than putting it in the nuke, you're putting it in your own hive. So you'll want the nuke centered in your box. So you don't want to take out five of the frames on one side and then smash your nuke over to the other side. So you put them right in the middle and that way they can grow out to the sides. And I believe that answers that question. What is your advice around handling bees for absolute beginners? Of course, there's some anxiety and I've heard bees can sense this. Would you recommend a mentor or a bee buddy when brand new beekeeper receives bees for the first time? Uh, yes. I always recommend keeping bees with a buddy. Um, I think it can, even if you both are newbies, it's helpful just to have a friend to go through the same experience with you. Cause there's a lot, it's certainly one thing watching a video about it. And then when you get your box of 10,000 stinging insects, you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> what have I done? Um, but in terms of them sensing your anxiety, it's less so that the bees like, oh, they smell your fear. It's more so that my body language is different when I'm anxious than when I'm calm. So my advice for beginning beekeepers is wear the amount of protective clothing that you feel most comfortable with. So I think we all saw Conrad just like, no protective gear, take some bees out. Hey, here are my bees. That's Conrad. And Conrad was so calm and so comfortable. So he can keep bees that way because he's not being anxious and he's not being jumpy. But if that's something that might scare you, you should wear your full bee suit, put on your gloves so that you feel comfortable. And that way, when you pick up things, you're not feeling a bee running down your bare skin. So cover up all of your skin with your protective gear and then that way you can make slow, calm movements. And this is great for the bees because if you're jumpy and dropping things and squishing bees, then that's agitating the bees more and then they're becoming defensive and more likely to sting you. So the calmer you are not squishing bees, that's the best way to keep the bees calm. So my, my advice is grab a buddy um, so Alex, I think is going to, we're going to send out the form afterwards. And then Alex is going to send out some small groups of people locally to get together. Um, so I highly recommend that. And then just wear all of your bee suit stuff. And if you feel, if you want to keep bees in just a veil, if you want to do bare hands, that's honestly um, a lot of experienced beekeepers really like either nitrile gloves or bare hands in their hive because you're very dexterous. So you can feel all of these little things. But um, I actually personally wear leather gloves um, for if I'm, I, there's sometimes that I will do barehanded things when I have to, but um, I've actually had an anaphylactic reaction to a bee sting. 
And I found that after that, I actually had some residual anxiety. So while I'm not jumpy and dropping things, it is this thing that I can feel tension in my body. And I'm like, you know what? I just want to be as calm as possible when I'm keeping my bees. This is a hobby <laughs> and something that I should enjoy. So I'm going to wear my leather gloves because it makes me feel most comfortable. So it's not a macho contest. Wear something that makes you feel comfortable around your bees. And I'm going to go through some of our other pre-questions. Let's see. Our kit did not come with a wooden hive stand. Is this mandatory for setup, even if we plan to have the hive nicely elevated? No, you don't have to have a wooden hive stand. I do like elevating the hive a little bit just to give me some options for like ant control and honestly for just ergonomics. So I'm not like bending all the way down when the hive is small. Um, but I've seen people put their hives on like cinder blocks or like pipes that are laid out to kind of reduce the entry points into the hive. So I think as long as you're elevating it off, I wouldn't put it like straight on dirt because that's gonna be something that's hard to keep little pests from crawling up into the beehive. Um, but that being said, I have seen bees kept on the ground and they've been fine. Um, but I think elevating a little bit is recommended, but you don't need like a fancy wooden hive stand or a fancy, uh, like any sort of fancy hive stand. Just keeping them up is usually just easiest to work with them rather than working with them on the ground. So there's a question that came across on the chat. Uh, and I thought Elizabeth could probably speak to this more is they're asking about gear. It's my understanding that Redwood City Feed is now stocking bee stuff. And we yes. kind of want to encourage them to keep doing that, right? Absolutely. So the Peninsula Feed Store in San Mateo is a fantastic place to go. I know a lot of people here probably um, uh, might have chickens, might have some other things. It's a really cool place in general. They are fantastic. So they are pretty new to beekeeping supplies, but it's much fast. I found that Man Lake used to have free shipping on over $100 and it used to get it to you fast, but I'm finding I just placed an order and it took like two weeks to get to me, which when I need something that is too long. So I go to Peninsula Feed Store and I'll buy frames if I need them, extra boxes. They've got a lot of equipment. And if you say you're a member of the guild, they will actually give you a discount. So remember to say you're a guild member and they'll give you a discount. Um, and if they don't carry anything, they'll do a special order as well. So I highly recommend going to Peninsula Feed Store um, for your beekeeping supplies. And then while you're getting it, you can check out their cute little chicks and baby quails in the back room too. So <laughs> great. Um, and I think they did just do a huge order for beginning beekeeping equipment. So I think it's also a great option for if you've never seen any of this equipment, it's really nice to go into Peninsula Feed Store and actually see it. Um, so that is a really big advantage of buying it there is you can actually see all of the equipment before you purchase it rather than just getting a huge box from Man Lake and being like, what is this? Um, so Peninsula Feed Store is fantastic. And I got another um, question, I think about the heat, which I believe I already answered. So in extreme heat, what do I do for my bees? So an established water source is important, but I find that the bees with water, they're okay. Like I had most of my hives in full sun in major heat waves and the bees can fan and their wax isn't, actually beeswax has a pretty high melting point of all of the wax. So it's not like their hive isn't gonna drip and like totally melt. So the bees are very good at ventilation. So they're not like your other critters um, so I know a lot of people have problems with chickens in the heat and things like that. Like chickens definitely need like extra like ice water, higher water intake with watermelons and things with bees. I will overwater my plants or, and like, so the saucer has some water in it, leave my hose at a very slow drip on heat wave days. But other than that, your, your basic waterer should take care of it and definitely get that established before it's hot. So that way they know it's there. What are alternative ways to check for mites? The sugar roll technique looks scary, especially for a beginner with no bee handling experience. Um, so I would say the sugar roll is about as scary as installing a package. So for a beginning beekeeper, like I, for my first hive, I was too scared to get a package because looking at the YouTube videos, you get like this, like 
professional beekeeper guy who's just like, yeah, you just take your bees and you hit the side and then dump them in there. And then there's your beehive. And, and that was a little like, <laughs> but it wasn't so scary. Um, so especially if you've got your bee buddy already, you guys could probably do, um, or if you get set up with a bee buddy, you guys could install a package at each other's houses and like do it together. So honestly, just having some moral support goes a long way. So I think for my first package, I had some moral support from my non beekeeping friends. Like I just suited up a friend and was like, can you just come with me? And, and that's okay. Um, but certainly having a buddy there can help you out. And the sugar roll is about the same is because the sugar roll involves you taking a frame of bees from the brood nest with baby bees on it, and then giving them a quick shake into a bucket. So they fall off, the foragers fly back home, the young uh, worker bees who usually carry the varroa mites are then left in the bucket. You kind of tip the bucket, scoop up a half cup of bees and put them in your peanut butter jar. And this is how you check for mites. So that is, I'd say, one of the most accurate ways. If you are looking for, if you are just like, I will not do that. Like I am not going to do a sugar roll. And so I'm just not gonna check for mites, I'd say, the sugar roll or an alcohol wash are the gold standard of checking for mites. If you want to do something else, there's a, a screened tray. So if you look for a bottom board, they have a mesh screen on the bottom and a tray that slides in and out. So you can also monitor mites that way. It might be a little misleading, so it's not as accurate, but it can help you out. So you can like wash off the screen and put it in for 24 hours and then take it out and count how many mites ended up on the bottom. Um, so that being said, it might not be super accurate because I've found that it is like, it's usually kind of in the ballpark of how many mites you have, um, but it could be that your bees are really great at grooming off mites. And so a lot end up on the tray or maybe they're really terrible at grooming off mites and there are no mites on the tray. So you see no mites on your tray. And you're like, great, my beehive doesn't have mites. No, they're all on the bees. So um, whereas if you have like a very hygienic hive and they're constantly grooming, you might get more on your bottom tray. Um, but I'd say a bottom tray is at least something to kind of get you in the ballpark of looking for mites. Um, and you can do it. I usually use the trays after I apply treatments. So when I apply a treatment and I wanna see how many mites fell off, I pull out that tray 24 hours later and try to see how many mites are on the tray. And usually it's a lot when I'm treating for mites. So I'm specifically trying to kill mites and have them fall down. But I'd say the sugar roll is really the gold standard to be working up to. Um, even as a beginner, it's amazing. Like it's really the best way to do it. And so Gretchen, you wanna ask another question? Yeah, in one of your videos, I believe you mentioned that you personally don't use, I hope I get the lingo right, um, a queen extruder to prevent her from going up into the honey supers. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, how do you prevent any brood from being laid in the honey supers? Great question. So, um, and it's a, it's a queen excluder. So um, Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. So queen excluder, because it is excluding her from the honey. So um, I actually don't prevent her from laying eggs wherever she wants. So my kind of mantra on that is that the queen is going to make a brood nest as large as she wants to. And that being said, I have to hunt a little harder for honey. And I need to know what brood looks like versus what honey looks like. So I will sometimes pull out a great frame of honey and be like, yes, I can take this. And then right at the bottom in a little tiny semicircle, there's like 10 baby bees in there. And that, is mean, that means I have to put that back and wait for it. So I have to like wait for those baby bees to be out of there. Um, so I can't harvest honey. So I have to look a little harder at my honey. Um, but I feel like the bees kind of are managing their spice, space the way they want it. That being said, there have definitely been years where I have just been so fed up with this of like, I'll go in and the queen will have laid like a little bit of babies on every frame with honey on it. And I'm like, bees, why are you doing this? And so then I will throw an excluder on um, so that when those babies hatch, 
they'll go back downstairs and then I can harvest that honey usually within the next three weeks. Um, so that's how I use the excluder. I've had more problems as a beginner. I had more problems with the excluder because um, you definitely have to be diligent about making sure your queen is downstairs. So if you're moving things all around and you accidentally move queen up to the honey supers, now you've got a big mess um, or she runs out of space and now the bees start putting all the honey down below. Um, so that's why I usually don't work with an excluder, but I do use it on occasion when I'm just like, I just want to harvest this honey and have no babies. So for 30 hives, I actually own two excluders and I'll throw it on on occasion when I need it. I will also use it when I'm producing comb honey. For comb honey, I want beautiful, fresh wax that a little baby bee has never been raised in. Because when um, a queen lays an egg in there, the larvae emerges and it will defecate in its little cell. And so then when it emerges out, it's kind of messy in there. So the other bees will clean it out as best as possible and then coat it with propolis. So a resin type substance that is, acts as an antimicrobial. And so the comb that the babies are raised in actually becomes darker and darker the more generations of babies they have in that comb. When I'm selling honeycomb, I want bright, white, beautiful wax because that's what you think of as comb honey. So I do use an excluder to keep the queen downstairs, not laying eggs in my comb, cut comb honey. But for extracted honey, it's totally fine um, to extract something that a baby has been in before. So let me get to Andrew. Yeah, um, I know that there's thousands of opinions on foundation versus foundation lists for, for keeping bees. As a new beekeeper that has made the stubborn decision to do foundation lists, is there anything that I need to be extra cautious or wary of compared to if I just had the foundation in on all of my frames? I would say for foundationless, so especially since you're starting from scratch, um, so you don't have anything else to go in there, um, I would inspect often because those bees will make a mess quickly. Um, so they might make this kind of puzzle pattern a little bit more in your hive. Um, the other thing is, so in your frames, you can use either a popsicle stick or a strip of beeswax. So if you buy some beeswax sheets, I think they do have beeswax sheets at um, Peninsula Feed Store. So if you buy like a sheet of beeswax, you can cut it into small strips and then hang it as a starting place for that comb. And having that kind of that edge of a popsicle stick or that small strip of beeswax hanging down from the middle of the frame to kind of start them off um, keeps it a little bit more like they're going to build a sheet of honeycomb as opposed to when you put all of your foundationless frames in there, it still kind of looks like an empty cavity. And bees tend to build comb running in the longest direction. So um, they're gonna build it in that direction, but they might choose the diagonal. So they might just build their comb in that diagonal way. So those popsicle sticks and strips are gonna help them build it in that um, nice groove. The other thing is, so if they do build it on a diagonal, you can actually gently break it off and then put it into your frame and use either um, like a baker's twine or a rubber band to hold the comb in place and they will reattach it within a day or two. So they will glue it into that frame. So if they have built it in a weird way, you can gently break off the comb put it into your frame how you want it, and then kind of tie it in place. And you'll also notice that they'll chew through the rubber bands and throw them out the front of the hive. So they'll clean out the string as well when they're not using it. Um, and I'd say those are the best things to do if you're really gung-ho for foundationless. Those are the techniques that will hopefully keep you um, doing well. The other thing is, so if you are breaking off comb, um, keep it oriented as best you can with that upside up. If you accidentally flip your comb, bees actually build their comb with a very slight upward tilt. And so if you flip it, it actually turns into like a downward tilt and they will never fill it again, ever with anything. So 
um, just try to keep your orientation when you're doing that. So it's a little tricky, but you, I, I believe in you. You can do it. <laughs> I guess, can I add on, um, if I ordered nukes through the guild, are those nukes coming with foundation? So that would maybe help with the cross comb issue a little bit? Good question. So um, the nuke, so Con Conrad could probably answer this, but let me answer it generally as well, is that the nuke is going to have, regardless of whether it has foundation, it's going to have comb. So I don't know what's in the exact middle of that frame, but it will have drawn comb and that can definitely help you. So while the hive is small, you might not want to do this, but eventually like baby bees have a finite space that they take up. A, a baby bee cocoon is a finite size. So if you have two frames of brood next to each other with baby bees and you put a blank frame in between, the bees are very likely to build like just a perfect honeycomb in between. Same thing with capped honey. Once they've capped the honey, you can put a frame in between and they'll build comb right in that nice little corridor. If you have uncapped honey, the bees, rather than like, oh, why would I make a new container? I can just make this container longer. So if you have uncapped honey and you put a frame in between, that uncapped honey is just going to keep getting bigger and take up the space and they might not build that honeycomb perfectly how you want. So yes, a nuke with comb can help you add into your hive. Um, that being said, with just five frames, with the way the weather has been recently, I wouldn't um, intersect frames in between the brood nest just because it helps keep the bees warm when they're all cuddled together. So I would still add your frames on the edge and then you can start being tricky like that when you add another box on top. Um, but definitely working with the nuke is gonna help you start out with a little something to make it easier. Kendall, can I quickly plug the, um, the guild bee sales? Yes. Um, okay, cool. So um, if you are interested in starting a hive this year, generally you want to start, um, you want to be able to acquire bees um, in the spring. Um, through the guild, there are multiple ways of acquiring bees. Um, we still have a few packages left, which are less expensive, but can be a little bit more intimidating for beginners. And we have two different ways of getting nukes. Um, Conrad, who's on the call, um, uh, is providing nukes. Um, and I'll and also um, there are a few left that the guild is also selling. Um, Conrad is a local beekeeper and can help you with questions. And um, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit more about that, Conrad, if they buy nukes from you. Sure. Um, I'm uh, selling queens and nukes all spring and summer. I am here in Woodside. Um, all nukes come with five frame drawn. Uh, frames, you know, pollen and one frame extra where the queen can lay, but all five of them are drawn. Um, and you can either buy them through the guild or directly from me, but uh, go to the guild. Cool. And the guild has a shop and we can pay with PayPal. Off you go. Yep. So you need to be a guild member in order to see the option to buy um, nukes and packages in the guild store. And one of the, the main advantages of buying packages versus nukes. So packages are usually a less expensive way to get started. Um, that being said, local nukes typically perform really well. Um, so sometimes with packages, you have some queen failure. They're, like It's not as common, but you're really starting out with something as a nuke. So buying a nuke from the guild or from Conrad. Um, I also sell nukes, but not through the, the guild. Um, so I sell them directly as well, but there's a lot of places you can get local bees and that's really fantastic. And I think, um, so Conrad, do you want to say anything else about your nukes? Oh, just, um, one of my focus, because I'm selling to, um, to you folks, um, I'm focusing a lot on gentle bees. Um, so Kendall can, I'm sure, attest to that too. So it's really important. Um, I pick basically, and also each queen is when she lays eggs, 50% of the eggs are part of uh, what the drone is. So uh, we have not so focused a lot about drones, but the drones is half of the queen, <laughs> basically, or half of the bees. So I'm focusing a lot on, on gentle bees. I definitely, I do that as well, because I find that like I, I put gentle bees above 
honey production. Like, of course I want both, but uh, keeping gentle bees is honestly, I usually pick my most docile queens that are the most productive, but do docility is usually my thing, especially keeping bees in such a, a dense suburban area. So Conrad, yeah, that's absolutely a great thing to do. So with with my nukes, I'm definitely not selling as much as Conrad does. So I'm going to uh, probably sell out very shortly. Um, I do offer, and I, Conrad, you might do this as well, but I, I offer the option to deliver my nuke and install it with you. Um, so if you are a little nervous, um, I install my nukes because I, I want my nuke box back. So when you're buying a nuke, you're buying the frames. And I like to get my boxes back. And I find that the best way to get my box back is just to deliver the bees. So <laughs> yeah. my, my system is that, that uh, you as a bee buyer come to my house um, and I transfer them to you. I show you the queen. I show you all the brood pattern. And then off you go back home again. And you just put it wherever you want to put it, open the entrance and you got, and you got bees. Ah, fantastic. Oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> I just wanted to add, uh, Kendall, that I also um, sell bees to my lesson clients, um, and I also emphasize gentle bees and bees that um, have never been treated from genetic lines that are naturally a bit resistant. That is fantastic. So that is Elizabeth, and uh, she is the, the VP of the guild. So there's definitely, there's a lot of guild members that have um, nukes for sale right now. So if you are a member of the guild, that'll give you access to the Google group. So the Google group is a fantastic place to ask questions. So you can snap pictures, send them to the guild. If you want to find like, hey, who's selling nukes, uh, members will respond and you can get stuff like that. So there's definitely a lot of options to get your bees now in the spring. Let's see, we've got Victoria, okay. I believe. Yeah. Are there standard size frames? or a standard size hive with the frame goes into? Yes, so that being said, there is um, there is a standard, but there are different sizes. So the standards are, you can have a deep frame or a medium frame. So I believe Conrad, you're selling deep frames, is that correct? correct. Yes, so and the guild is also selling nukes with deep frames. Um, so you want to make sure you have a deep box to accept that. Um, that being said, if you have chosen to keep in medium hive boxes and you've bought a nuke with deep frames, you can actually put two mediums, so an empty medium box with no frames, then put another medium box and that deep frame is, it's taller. So that way it hangs. And so there's gonna be a little extra space at the bottom, but the bees will fill it out. So if you have made a mistake, it's not like, oh, everything's ruined. You can fix it. It's totally fine. And same thing the other way around. If you've bought a, I sell medium nukes. Um, so I guess that's the other difference is that um, Conrad, the guild, they're selling deep frames mm -hmm. that go into deep boxes. I'm selling medium frames that go into medium boxes. So if you have a deep box, you can put my five medium frames in the middle, and then the bees usually build on an extra few inches of comb at the bottom of that frame. And then you can put your deep frames on either side of it. Um, so there's definitely a way to fix it if you've bought the wrong size, but those are the two standard sizes, is deep and medium. Uh, since it seems like we're winding down, um, this is the beginning of my third year for all of you that are thinking of joining the guild. Uh, and I can honestly say that without the guild and the Google group, it would have been a disaster. Uh, it's a great support means. Uh, there's just an infinite amount of resources from all these really caring and kind people. And just like um, if you're into dogs and you want to like post a picture of your dog and have everybody go, oh my God, look at that dog. You know, you put your picture up of, look, I found this or I did that. And super supportive. Um, the only caveat and probably one of the uh, most true statements I ever heard was that if you ask three beekeepers a question, you get five different answers. So beekeeping is um, a science, but it's also an art and everybody has their preference and how they do things. So there's never really one solid correct answer and you find your own way uh, and the guild will help you find that way based on past experience as well as um, 
kind thoughts and advice. So if you are seriously considering doing bees or you want to do bees, you cannot go wrong by joining the guild. It's just the best investment you can make to uh, be successful. Absolutely. And I think Guy brings up a great point of that. Um, I think I've certainly been saying how I do things. That being said, I actually still go and keep bees with other people. I still take classes, even though I'm, I'm in the master beekeeper program um, at UC Davis. So I do consider myself um, to have a very high level of expertise in this. I am always going to classes because I always pick up like little tidbits from other people on how, what might work better for me. So with my queen excluder answer of like, oh, I don't use queen excluders. You might start keeping bees and being like, Kendall, you're crazy. This is awful. Use a queen excluder. So it's whatever works best for you. So I've just found this is a lot of the stuff that works best for me, but definitely you will get a lot of different answers and a lot of strong opinions if you ask a lot of beekeepers. <laughs> and let's see, I think Elizabeth has a question as well. Yes, I was wondering um, if I have hummingbird feeders in my yard, will, will they become inundated with honeybees or is that a conflict to have sugar water out? I didn't know. I know that sounds, I just wanted to know, like, it, what do you do about that? So my, my answer to that is maybe. Um, it depends on the type of honey, hummingbird feeder um, and how secure it is and where the sugar water is compared to the opening. Um, so if you've got like a small little opening for hummingbird beak and the sugar water is far enough down, the short stubby little bee tongue can't get in there. So with certain, with a good hummingbird feeder, your bees are not going to get in. That being said, if it's an old feeder and maybe has some cracks and the bees can kind of get in, they might be on it. Um, maybe not so much in the spring. Um, so in the springtime, there's a lot of nectar and I find that I can take a frame of honey and like leave it out near my bees in the springtime. And they're kind of like, eh, whatever. It might take them a while to find that. If I do that in September and it's been hot and it's been dry for months and I take a frame of honey out of my kitchen, I am pretty much immediately covered in bees. So um, a lot of that could have to do with time of year. So I think in the spring, you might not notice it as much in the fall the bees are gonna be getting more desperate and might be much more attracted to your feeders. Um, so I'd say keep an eye on it and different types of feeders can definitely provide some relief from that, but you might end up taking your feeders down in the fall. Um, but I think I've had feeders up all year round, certain feeders and have had no trouble. Hey Kendall, this is the other Elizabeth. Um, I have something to add to Elizabeth's question there. If, um, she Googles, hummingbird feeder bee guards. She'll see these little yellow basket things that you can buy to put on your hummingbird feeders to keep the bees from being able to reach their tongues into it. Of course, as you say, it doesn't work if there's a crack, but it does cover the um, feeding ports for the, to keep the bees out of them. Absolutely, that great tip. Um, and I just saw another um, question pop up in the chat about, um, hey, if I picked a hive location and it doesn't work out, uh, can I move my bees? Yes. Um, so if you're moving them within your own yard, it is a bit of a process because um, I think I saw Alex respond to this of moving a hive more than three feet and less than three miles is the hardest. So if I'm moving my hive across town, no problem. I close them up at night, like truck them across town. It's fine. Moving them within my own yard, the foragers kind of get this like autopilot a little bit. So like they leave their hive. So if I move my hive from one side of my yard to the other, the foragers come out and they're like, ah, I've seen this place. They go, they fly out, collect the food, and then they come back and they're on autopilot to their old hive location. So they end up at the old spot that has no hive. And so we've got this cloud of bees being like, oh my God, my home is gone. And they haven't noticed that it has moved just 10 feet across the yard. So um, to move your hive to a new location, you I usually scoot them about a foot every day. So every morning when it's kind of cool and the bees aren't out, I come and I tug my hive, like I scoot about a foot. And then when the foragers come out, there is maybe some more activity on their return. Um, but it usually takes me then 10 days to move my hive 10 feet. 
So you just need some patience to move your hive from your original location. So keep that in mind when you are sighting your bees. Do try to choose the best one, but if not, you might end up like dragging your hive a foot at a time. Um, but most locations should work. And if they don't work for you, you can use screens. Um, so I've seen people use PVC pipe with like shade cloth on it to direct bees in other directions. So you can definitely adjust your location without dragging your hive across your yard. Oh, and Alex suggests using a wagon or a wheelbarrow to make this easier. That definitely makes it easier, especially if you have a large hive. If you decide that you don't like your location in July, your hive is big. So the sooner you make your decision, the better. So one more question is, what's the minimum space required for a hive? Would it be possible to keep at an apartment on a 10 by 20 fenced patio? Or is finding my bee buddy the best way to get experience? Um, so I would say that um, the main thing you're dealing with at an apartment complex would be legality and permission. Um, so you might not have permission from your landlord on your patio. So while you could keep your bees on a patio, um, I think it's highly unlikely that your landlord would give you the go ahead to keep bees there. Um, mentioning that like keeping bees, like you can either keep bees with a bee buddy or um, the guild honestly gets a lot of requests for people who want bees in their yard, but don't wanna be beekeepers. So it is an option to keep uh, bees at other people's yards. Um, and that's actually how I started out. I was in an apartment and I had family in the Bay Area that had a backyard and I was like, oh, I'm gonna put bees in your yard. Okay, bye. <laughs> um, so that's how I got my first bees. Um, so you can definitely, check them on the weekends. They don't need daily supervision um, and it can still work out. So it is possible to keep bees on a patio um, at an apartment, but you probably won't get the go ahead in my, in my experience. Let's see, I think that is all. So thank you guys all for tuning in. Thank you guild members for joining and chiming in. Thank, thank you, you so Kendall. much. Thank you. thank you. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank you.